Good morning. How you doing? All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. It's been a fun, a fun couple of days here, I must say. And I got to tell you, I am so grateful, so proud, so humbled to be here with you all today. Like you all, I am a computer scientist. I'm a developer, an engineer, data scientist. And every time I wake up in the morning, I see that we're living in this technology-fueled business societal renaissance, you know. Uh, cloud, data, artificial intelligence, transactions, this democratization of technology that allows us to do our jobs faster, better, building on the shoulders of giants, of open source projects that started in the 80s with compilers all the way through to where we are today. And it, and it is such a fun time to be an innovator. But at the same time, you know, <laughs> this doesn't come without blood, sweat, and tears, okay? Perhaps a little bit of tears, <laughs> right? And, and I want to start the conversation, and in fact, you're going to hear me say this several times throughout this presentation, with one thing, and that is thank you. Thank you to all of you who spend your time writing code, working in working groups, et cetera. So can you give yourselves a round of applause, please? Come on. It's not that early. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Because it really does take a lot. In fact, it's interesting, you know, for, for those of us who, uh, for folks who don't live in this open source world every day, there's an incredible amount of very positive hype around open source. In fact, I've, hope, you know, I've, I've heard people talk about open source like it smells like freshly washed linen. Well, for that, you know, container build to run and act like freshly washed linen, a lot of work happens in order to get there, right? So as I go through this investment that we all put in as a community and as an organization, uh, as people, uh, I'd like to do that by looking at the past first. So let's go into a little time machine. Let's go back. Let's jump into the past. So does everybody know how open source started or how this notion of collaborative computing started? Well, very academic driven. We, we know that, right? Because in academia, we collaborate quite a bit. But the first real big awakening was in the 90s. And I, I remember I had just, uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I went to college, got a PhD in computer science, and I went right to IBM Research. You know, and, I'm <laughs> and here I am at IBM Research, the kid sitting here. And to my left, I have Mandelbrot fractals. You know, and to my right, I got Bob Denard, the person who invented DRAM. <laughs> like, oh my god, what am I going to do? <laughs> right? Because you know, the world of computer science is so amazing. But you know, this notion of Linux and collaborating around operating systems or democratizing how people build technology around Java and tooling with Eclipse or what's happening in Apache, those were the things that started to create open source center of gravity, it's places where we as developers can go and innovate and do it in a safe way and do it in a way that is meritocracy driven. What matters is the value of your code the value of your test case, the value of what you bring, not the dollars in your pocket, okay? And that is what exploded an industry, and that was giving us all an opportunity to innovate. And here we are now today in the second awakening, or the second renaissance of open source, right? We have been building out together explicitly a lot of what I think about when I talk to our development teams, and, and, I, and I run everything that touches developers, uh, in, in IBM, an open cloud data, artifi artificial intelligence, and transaction architecture. And that is significant. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. That is, well, I'll put a little punctuation point on that. That is significant. Imagine, you know, we are reinventing technology, democratizing technology, right? And we're doing that in a way that is open, that allows everyone to contribute and everyone to gain value from that. But the question that we always ask, that folks always ask, whether you work for a big company, some of you all, anybody work for companies? Raise your hand if you work for a company, right? You work for yourself. I would work for free, by the way, because I have so much fun. Don't tell anybody, right? You have to somehow justify this, right? Why do I have to go to Vancouver, right? Why do I need to be in this working group? Who's paying for open source? And who benefits from open source? And when I say pay, it's not all about money, okay? It is also time and investment 
right? Time away from your family, time you spend coding, time you spend thinking about things over dinner, right? So I like to put this in perspective across three areas, the consortia, the enterprise, and the individual. And hopefully at the end, as we get through this here in the next couple of minutes, we'll also have an appreciation of who benefits, because we all benefit. The companies we work for benefit, the consortia benefits, us as individuals benefit, and believe it or not, the world benefits. And we'll talk about that. So let's start with the consortia. Something like, say, the Linux Foundation. You know, there is a huge responsibility in creating a nurturing, open, collaborative environment for innovation, for code, for development that spans not just you know, the code itself, but the end users, which, by the way, is a big difference from how we used to do things in the 90s. You know, one of my first jobs at IBM Research was to work with Tim Berners-Lee on a lot of the original web standards and parsers and things, so I got to co-author things like CSS and the DOM and HTML and XML, and I wrote, you know, first XML parser in C++ and then in Java. And, you know, when we were doing this stuff, do you know why the web was created? You know what, do you know what the first use case for XML was? It was the mathematical markup language. It was the first DTD. It was even no schemas. DTD for, for XML. That was the use case. And it's great because we want to disseminate math and science information. But when you're using your phone and you're using protocols and HTTP and sending you know, things on these protocols or viewing a page as being styled by CSS inside your browser or on the device, eh, you've got a different use case in mind. <laughs> Right? Not so much math. <laughs> you know, maybe you're buying something. Uh, maybe you're playing a game, right? Um, and so what's amazing, uh, and what the consortia, one of the biggest things that they've done in, in this kind of second awakening, is establishing the end user as a first-class entity. And think about the innovation that can come when end users happen. Another really important thing that the consortia have done is that it's helped realize that not all open source is created equal. Some couches are better than other. Some pieces of code is better than other, right? And when you're out there and you're using a piece of code, I think you'd like to know that maybe that piece of code would last a little bit, that if there's a change that it will get updated or you'll be notified, or if you want to submit uh, an update to a piece of code, there's a way for you to do that so that you can actually use that code without forking it and keeping you know, the legacy code yourself <laughs> for the rest of your life, <laughs> right? So this notion of governance, this notion of you know, taking those couches and helping create you know, beautiful rooms around them, centers of gravity with responsible licensing, you know, a diverse ecosystem, a, a meritocracy for how you participate, open governance, has been fundamental to the progress of open source. And a case study that I absolutely love, that because I was fortunate to be a part of from the beginning, is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. In fact, Jim and myself and a colleague from Google stood at stage at OSCON a couple years ago and announced this Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And since then, and thanks to the leadership of the Linux Foundation, I mean, you can't kind of cross the street by, getting, by, by not seeing a container somewhere, right? And someone talking about microservices and, and, and how do I expose things as, uh, as APIs to live in a microservices, whether I'm a, a Springbot app or some other app. Everybody wants to be a microservice, right? And, uh, but it's amazing to see that has, how, how that has happened. So the investment in doing all of that is amazing. So to all the consortia out there, thank you. Number two, woo, I heard a woo, you're in the Linux Foundation, aren't you? All right, let's give a thanks to the Linux Foundation. Thank you very much, thank you, thank you. It's always good to get a woo at nine in the morning, let me tell you, because I could use a little of that. All right, the enterprise, the folks who employ us, right? Enterprise is kind of a strange, big word, but it's not just financial commitment. Obviously, organizations, you know, Jim spoke about some of the things we've done early on in IBM, and, and you know, I, I didn't fully appreciate it when, when I first joined IBM, because that's when the first renaissance was occurring. Um, you know, but for a company like IBM, for example, in the days of Linux, to say, you know what, we're going to protect all the intellectual property in open source with our patent portfolio. That gave us, as open source practitioners, 
a freedom <laughs> that we're not going to be litigated at. Because <laughs> IBM has a lot of patents, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's those kinds of things that really make this all work for us. But it's also sustained development. And what do I mean by that? Well, one thing at IBM, we're not open source leeches. I can quote me on that, right? We obviously use a lot of open source. In fact, you take your typical IBM product or service, it's about 75% open source. We run the open source process for the company. Everything sits in the CI, CD. All our developers are what we call open source certified, right? Uh, they know how to use code, they know how to contribute code, and we participate. We have tens of thousands of developers using and contributing to communities, whether it's in leadership roles or doing all the, the work and just building test cases, running builds, and so forth. It is, it is a fun thing to do. In fact, one question I often get asked, and the reason I show this is, is that how do I, how do I learn to do that as well? So if you wanna talk to your companies about how to become more open, Go visit developer.ibm.com forward slash open, and that can give you some tips to convince them and explain the value. But it all is about fixing bugs, doing the dirty work, and earning your stripes. Because at the end of the day, just because you can write a check to help create a foundation, you know how much influence that gives you in the code? Zero. The influence comes from the people who are doing the work, who get that voted in to run the different areas and get your code accepted. So, Two things before I leave this part. A beautiful example of, of an open community is the open mainframe project for the IBM Z. Think about it. You can scale a node application to receive a billion RESTful requests by pressing one little button. Imagine you had to write that in code. And you, you, don't, yeah, and you don't even know it's a Z system. So that's the kind of innovation that's occurring. And you look at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and all of the vendors have gotten excited about that. Another great example. So, to the enterprises, to your bosses, to our bosses, let's give them a thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is the pattern, right? <laughs> thank you, <laughs> because it allows us to do what we do. Now the individual, oh, that's the heart, right? This is, this is what makes open source work. And we're responsible for doing the code, for driving and erasing, and for driving innovation and fostering collaboration. Look at that handsome fellow up there on the left in mud. That's me in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and, uh, and I got to say, we all start from humble beginnings. I wasn't born a computer scientist, trust me. I lived on a farm, OK? I used to follow the cows and shovel when I was in sixth grade before I went to school. And that wasn't very pleasant. But I am so fortunate to be here because of others, because of others who helped me learn how to code, who brought together code, community, content in a place so that I can learn and participate and grow with others. And all of you do that every day. You're either being helped or you are helping, okay? And that's how we become great together through humble beginnings. In fact, we just relaunched a site, developer.ibm.com, IBM developer, and we focused it exactly on that. So imagine if you live in Austin or you live in India or you live in London, and you're trying to connect and meet somebody who's active in containers. We make it easy for you to find all of the open source meetups, all the events that are occurring, all the code patterns, all the learning that can help you get there. So I challenge you, if you're a developer and you feel alone, you're not alone. Come to developer.ibm to come and we'll pair you with the open source world. And it is all about how we behave, okay? And we know this. But as individuals, there's investment not just in our time and money, but as in how we act. You have to be nice. You have to be a doer, not a talker, right? You have to mentor people, okay? Don't be a drive-by committer. In other words, don't just throw code once and then never do anything with it. That's not cool, <laughs> all right? You gotta build trust. Do the dirty work, all right? Learn about what you're doing. Don't think you know exactly everything about a piece of code that's there. Know the licenses. Be authentic. These are the kinds of things that we think about. And the people, again, following the case study, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, look at the growth. Look at the growth of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in just a short amount of time. It is spectacular, right? The number of meetups, the number of end users, the number of participants who are dealing with this. Now, the world, okay? Look, if you think about it, 
Oh, first of all, I forgot something. Thank you to the individual. I think all of us <laughs> thank ourselves, yes. Okay, very good. Uh, how can I forget the most important part? I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous up here, you know, as you can tell. I get a little nervous on stage. All right, look. About, about a year ago, we were thinking about how can we harness the power of developers to do good? Okay, because you know, by the way, as computer scientists, we're coding all the time, whether you're paying us or not. Okay, and how do we harness that for good? We launched something with the Linux Foundation, the United Nations, the Red Cross, a venture capital firm called NEA, and at this point, 50 plus other corporations and open source communities called Call for Code. It is a four month long hack for good. It ends on September 28th, so still time to participate. And this year, it's about preparing for disasters. Remember I'm from Puerto Rico? It was pretty rough. My parents still don't have electricity, okay, in their house. It's rough. Software could have made a difference. Software will make a difference. And there's lots of reasons for you all to join, not just helping people prepare for disasters. But guess what? The first couple solutions will be deployed, winners will be deployed for real. So this isn't just some hack for fun. This is a hack that will make a difference. So if we can save one life, 10 lives, 1,000 lives, you can make a difference. Software, open source, can make a difference. $200,000 is not bad either, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good price. You're also judged by folks who are pretty famous, like Linus, like the head of United Nations Human Rights, the CEO of the Red, of the Red Movement, right? There's famous judges. You'll have a chance, if you win or you're in the finalists, to to uh, pitch your stuff to the world's largest venture firm. It's not bad, right? And the top 10 or so projects will live on in the Linux Foundation as open source projects. This is a five year commitment that we made, right? Bringing open source to the world and so many people have gotten involved. In fact, I, and this is one thing that just blows my mind, <laughs> okay? Not just your typical companies, you know, large enterprises, open source organizations, charitable organizations, but celebrities. Uh, just in World Humanitarian Day, which was a couple weeks ago, whether you like DJ Panda or Justin Bieber or Cheyenne, who's from Puerto Rico, or anyone in the middle, there are celebrities tweeted and Instagrammed and Facebooked about this. There's huge vis visibility out there, and that is so amazing and so special, okay? So in the end, when people ask me, Who's paying for open source? I say, we all are, but guess what? It's freaking worth it, right? Okay, guys, thank you so much and thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.